here's the thing. We may have a slight problem. But I'm making bail, right? You said if I cooperated, I'd make bail. I know. You said you could keep me out of jail. You said community service, mm -hmm. picking up trash on the side of the road. You said those things. I'm a librarian. I can't survive in here. There's, there's gangs. Yeah. There's murderers. There's a, there's a woman who ate someone. Rhonda, I'm doing everything I can, but I just met with the prosecutor and he's playing hardball. I don't understand. He's refusing to plea bargain. They're making an example of you to deter others. The charge stands at treason. He's seeking five to ten. Months, right? Years. Hi, guys. And hi, Jenna. Hello. I could not be more excited to have you here talking about the show because the clip you saw, if you thought the clip was funny, that's like 1% of how funny the show is, I would say. It's totally. That's a mathematical analysis that I just did on my own. I like your equation. OK. Um, it's a bonkers show. It's totally crazy. And I'm sure, how many of you watch The Office? <laughs> right? So you know Pam on The Office. Take everything you know about Pam and throw it in jail. It is a little bit like if you put Pam in jail <laughs> and then you made a meteor hit the earth and then you teamed her up with a crazy career criminal, busted her out of jail and made her travel across the country back home to her family while like robbing and kidnapping people along the way, then it would be exactly like The Office. Well, you forgot that she's paired with a career criminal with a swastika on her forehead. Yes, I forgot. That's right. That's yes. It's intense. It's, <laughs> it's, it's an intense ride, the show. It really is. It's crazy. It was, it was made uh, in London for mm -hmm. British television, except unlike The Office, this isn't a remake. This is a, a re-airing of the original show, which has already aired over there. And um, so me and, and Megan Mullally and Rob Lowe, are, we play Americans, and we are American characters. And then the others are um, like British television stars. And Rob Lowe plays the kind of priest that you hope you never encounter in real life. Except he's, that he's hot. I mean, well. Um, no, he plays a foul-mouthed. Chain-smoking. Chain-smoking, boozing priest. And his job is to um, debunk claims by people that they are the second coming of Christ. So he, his title is Devil's Advocate. And that's his job at the Vatican. And so now that the end of the world has come, he's been charged with trying to determine if mm -hmm. all the people coming out of the woodwork claiming to be the second coming truly are or not. That's kind of a daunting job, wouldn't you? I mean, I would, I would not want that. To do. It's a lot to do. Yeah. How did you come to do this? Um, I, was, uh, I was sent the script. I, I took some time off after the office to grow my family. I had a ba another baby, mm -hmm. so I have two kids now. And um, I took a nice long maternity leave. And then um, I was sent this script. And it was so funny and different. And um, you know, with The Office, I spent almost 10 years at the same desk, in the same room, with the same people, wearing on the same cardigans. sound stage. Yes, wearing pantyhose and the same pencil skirt. <laughs> and I thought, uh, my next job, I want to get out a little. I want to see the world. And so this was a really cool opportunity. I got to live in London with my family for six months. And um, I also got to travel to South Africa for this show. And um, they shot some of it in Malta. And it was just, it felt like an adventure. It felt like something different. I got to do stunts. I got to be in like car chases and stuff. And, um, and it was also really funny and really original. How did you keep, I mean, I know it's called acting for a reason, but in all seriousness, how did you keep a straight face? Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, it's always funnier when you can manage to keep a straight face, right? So it's like there's so much pressure mm -hmm. not to ruin the great job someone else is doing by laughing. So um, a person who was just amazing at that was Oscar Nunez on The Office. He never broke. The first time that he broke was when Steve Carell went to kiss him <laughs> on Gay Witch Hunt because that was an improvisation. That was not in the script that mm -hmm. Michael was going to kiss Oscar for a long time on the lips to prove he's not gay or doesn't have a problem with gay people. So, um, 
So that was, Oscar lost it because he saw Steve coming in for the kiss and he, we, had to, we had to do a second take of that. But in this one, what, what, I mean, do you see anything of yourself in Rhonda? Oh, yeah. I mean, in the sense that um, my character is in prison because she's protecting, protecting her, her son. son. I did not, I am not a computer hacker. And my son hacked into the NSA's computer system just for fun because he's a teenager and he was bored. And so I'm- As one does. As one does. So I'm just protecting him. So mm -hmm. I feel like I can relate to her overwhelming desire to protect her kid. And then when news of the end of the world comes, I can completely relate to her desire to want to do anything she has to do to get back to her family so she can see them one last time. And that's what's really interesting about the show is because you take people who are otherwise very morally uh, on the up and up, but they do some immoral things because they're faced with the end of times and you only have so many days and so you're doing things that you wouldn't normally do under different circumstances. So it gets very complicated who the good guys are and who the bad guys are and who deserves to survive in this bunker in the end, and who doesn't, and why. And at least your character does come supplied with air freshener, so I think <laughs> yeah. that that gets her entry immediately. Yeah, that's pretty fun. That's My character good. has a very fun scene where she tries to loot a convenience store along the way, and she doesn't know what to grab, <laughs> so she just gets a little grabby. Starts grabbing whatever. What was the most fun scene for you to shoot? Um, actually, that convenience store scene, looting the convenience store, when I read that in the script, that mm -hmm. made me want to do the project. That was the thing I was most excited to shoot. Um, but then we had um, a bus crash that we got to shoot, and I was really excited to shoot this. Um, we're all riding in a van, and we have a crash. And When you guys escape from prison? After we escape okay. from prison. Oh, see, so yeah, now, uh, did I just give too much away? See, I'm no, not. Uh, no, no. Okay. You guys, we escape from prison. Okay. It's okay. It happens, and I don't think it's going to be too big of a surprise. <laughs> Certainly not anymore. <laughs> that I, I know, told I'm you. sorry. I <laughs> always worry about saying too much, especially when I get excited about something that I really like. What can you tell us about your arc going forward? On this show? Yes. Um, well, we've shot the whole season. It's aired over in mm -hmm. Britain, so I guess don't look too hard on the internet or you'll find all the spoilers. Um, the show opens with a group of people in a bunker underground, and then a meteor hits and the world ends. And then you flash back 34 days earlier and you see how and why all those people end up being the survivors. So the show kind of opens and closes at the same time. So going forward, we will have to, I guess, we're what's left of You're humanity. What's left. Yeah. You have to rebuild. Yeah. God this love you. Crazy ya. group of people. See, look, there's a guy who plays twins. He has an evil twin and a good twin. He's a bank manager. See, it's crazy, the show. We've got evil twins. No, the show really is. I mean, it, the fact that... It's I'm so, so fun. I'm so glad that they are airing it as it is, as opposed to tweaking or modifying any of it. Yeah, this, is the sh this was the show, and it was, it, they liked it over there. It was a big hit. So, What was the experience like shooting in the UK? It's very different from America. In America... First of all, there's tons of food all the time on sets. There's tons of snacks. There's <gasps> snack tables. They put snacks in your trailer. I don't know how actors stay so thin in America with all the constant snacks that are provided. They would, I, at 10 in the morning on the set of The Office, they'd come out with shrimp scampi or like a hot dog bar. What? I'm telling you, it's like a Vegas buffet every day. I it had is no ridiculous. idea that you guys had a hot dog bar. Hot dog bar on Tuesdays. It was... It's more food than anyone needs to eat. I don't know. The crew eat a lot of food. You know, they're like big yeah. guys lugging cameras and equipment and stuff like that. So I think the hot dog bar is a little bit more for them. In the, in the UK, no snacks. There's like no snacking, no food or anything. But at 3.30 every day, they come around with a tray of tea sandwiches and tea cookies and hot tea. And they take a, like a, a moment for tea. That's actually Isn't that so, so refined? sweet and civilized. Isn't that so sweet? Yeah, I know. Yeah, that That's really so actually is. Yeah, they take that tea thing as real. Oh, my gosh. So are you like a tea aficionado now? No, but for Christmas, my husband did get me one of those um, tea kettles that you plug into the mm -hmm. wall and makes the water hot for you. Like a proper because, tea kettle. Yeah, that, which is how the English do it. And so I did get kind of into that. Um, 
the apartment that they rented for us while we were there came with one of those, and I got a little addicted to it. Aww. And I got into the tea at 3.30. It became kind of a routine. It's a nice little pick-me-up. Is it different shooting there in the sense of the work schedule? Yes. It, they have a much more um, kind of like family-friendly lifestyle. Um, so like a lot of businesses in the United States, I think they can become, jobs become very consuming and very demanding and they sort of, there is no such thing as a nine to five job anymore. No. I feel like everybody works from 7.30 to 8 p.m. these days. And so, um, and in the entertainment industry, it can be like especially consuming. And so one of the reasons that I took this job actually was because I, I wanted a, a family-friendly job. So this, this cast was really big, so mm -hmm. I only worked one or two days a week, and I would have weeks off at a time in between, and the hours are really, um, they, they don't work, they don't do like a lot of overtime working. So I was often home for dinner on days that I was shooting. So it was much, much more laid back. And I have to ask you, and I'm sure you've been asked this so many times, what would you do if you knew the world was ending? I mean, if you had like... I would eat at the hot dog bar, first of all. Um, and then I would eat at the macaroni bar. And then I would go to the Sunday bar. And then I would go to the donut store. Wait, so, wait, wait. I have to backtrack. This, yeah. is, this was all offered on the office set? It's on every set. Because, oh my God. Every set has this all the time. Yeah. This is a little, like, I guess this is some insider trivia about sets, about life on a set. Because I've been to movie sets and there's like craft services and that's like... Yeah, uh, craft services. There's like donuts and the things and the foods and you, the whatevers and the soda and the whatevers. All the time. It's so crazy. I can't wrap my, my head around it. And yet you're, you're expected to look a certain way. How is this possible? I don't know. My, my parents would come visit me on the office set and they loved it. They would love it. They would be like, do you have to-go containers? We wanted to... <laughs> you know? <laughs> Because, you know, they would want to take stuff home. They're like, this is, we can eat this for dinner. This is good leftovers. For you, what was the, was there any challenge to playing Rhonda? Or was it just, I mean, it sounds like it was a completely joyous and amazing experience. Well, the show really can do anything at any time. So there's, you'd never utter the phrase, I don't think my character would do that. I don't, and because your character can and will do anything at any time. So that was a little bit, um, there were things that I would read in the scripture that I would be asked to do and I would be completely shocked. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it, but I had to just accept it and do it without argument because that, that was the spirit of the show. Um, so I think that was maybe the most challenging thing was that I, could, I never could predict her behavior. And how did you and the cast, I, I mean, I assume you and Megan know each other, but how did the cast vibe? Did you guys go out to dinner to, to, to get to know each other or anything like that? Um, we didn't really do a lot outside of work, I wouldn't say. Um, Matt Bainton, who plays the twins, <laughs> he has a son the same age as my son. So we did do some play dates on the weekends, and we were living close by one another. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, on set, we would eat together and, and things like that. But, yeah, we... Oh, no. You have a life, is what you're saying. Yeah, kind of, yeah. right? I mean, like, do you all go out with everybody you work with? Every like, night. Every night yeah. and have drinks with them and party uh, you know, it totally, up? Totally, totally. Right, I know. It doesn't mean anything. I, I like them all. <laughs> I just also like my family. <laughs> I want to be alone you with wanna them. You want to see your kids once in a while. Yeah. That would be nice, right? <laughs> yeah. How do you choose projects now? Kind of what goes into you saying yes to something? Yeah, I, I have a very different criteria now when I pick a project. Um, before I was married and had mm -hmm. kids... You know, the first thing was, is this artistically interesting to me, and does it seem fun and exciting, and I'll go anywhere in the world and do it for any amount of time. But now, I, my first filter is, how does this impact my family's life? Because when I say yes to a project, the whole family is saying yes to the project. And um, my husband is a writer-director, and similarly, when he is going to go do a movie, the whole family does mm -hmm. the movie. And um, we all move with him, and we live on his location, and we set up a life. And so... It's, um, that's the first filter is what kind of experience does saying yes to this project create mm -hmm. for my family. And then the second one is probably goes back to that, like, is this artistically exciting? Does it feel um, both challenging but also in my wheelhouse, like something I feel like I can do but maybe stretches me a little because mm -hmm. I find that interesting? And then, you know, the third thing is, like, does it pay money? 
you know, how is it a financially responsible decision? And, um, and so that's kind of my criteria. What's, uh, <laughs> what stretched you the most about playing Rhonda in terms of just playing the character? I think it was, it was physically demanding. So when I started the show, um, I was about uh, seven months uh, postpartum. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm a lady who has babies and, like, takes a real long time to, like, get back into those pre-pregnancy genes. I'm, I don't like to rush that stuff. Um, so I, I sort of like to take like a year or two to just kind of slowly let everything settle to what it wants mm -hmm. to be so I don't push it. So as a result, I just wasn't super physically fit when I started this role, and yet I was having to like run away from meteors and things like that and be in car crashes. And so like maybe my abs, my core wasn't quite ready to, you know, do as many stunts as I was required to do. But over the course of the shooting, um, my, I'm trying to figure out how to say this without being a spoiler, my character goes through a certain kind of transformation mm -hmm. that actually made it very well timed for me to uh, kind of lose that additional baby weight and get in shape. So my character, as the show goes on, you actually see a little bit of a physical transformation. Um, and I had a very long break in filming where I did actually train with a trainer and put some energy into mm -hmm. it. And that was kind of part of my job because at the end, she's a very different woman than how she starts. Was that vague enough, but also that specific enough? That actually was vague enough. Okay. And that leads me to the most important question of this interview, which is your wardrobe on the show. Mm. Which, yeah. if you could launch a clothing line based on what she wears, yeah. I think it would do really well. No, uh, one of the, uh, I'll say, let me back it up. So first is, how does this job impact my family? The second is, what am I wearing, and does it double as pajamas? <laughs> and then this prison fatigues would be a, a check mark in the yes mm -hmm. column for that. So, um, so yeah, it was great. I mean, I, I'm in my prison fatigues most of the film. Um, and then, uh, but I do wear some disguises. My character is on the run. She has to be in some disguises. It's fun. It's, like, really, like fun, old-fashioned kind of good time. And are you, is the show coming back for season two? We don't know yet. They, they haven't said. Yeah, yeah, I think we find out in like a month or two. I yeah. would, I mean, I, w I would think. It was, it yes. did really well yes. over there. So I think we, we all feel pretty hopeful. I know they've, they've already ordered scripts and they've written some scripts and they're paying for things. I feel like when you start paying for, for things. For things and it's going to happen. You are kind of. So, going that way, yeah. So then you're just going to relocate right back to England and get right back to we work. We would. We would. We would go back for another six months. Do you and your husband try to take turns working, if that's at all possible? We do. We do. Because um, because the jobs are very consuming, mm -hmm. we like to have um, a parent who is consistently in the house waking up and you know, having dinner mm -hmm. and putting the kids to bed. And that's really important to us. I'm from Missouri. I'm from St. Louis. I ate dinner with my family every night. We had family dinner. You know, my mom was a school teacher, so she worked. But she was there when I got home from school. And um, so I, it's, um, it's a really interesting thing in, in an industry that can be so kind of hectic and chaotic we really are very thoughtful and precise about creating a, a home life that's as stable and consistent as possible. So they don't notice that we do this work. That's amazing. That's, especially that's given, like one of the, we have more yeah. conversations about that than I think anything else. That they, like your son does not know that you're an actress and that um, people know It's who not you that are. I would mind if he knew I was an actress. But um, it's more that, like, this choice that I've made with my mm -hmm. life, it doesn't consume his life. Like, we still have a very, like, um, child-centered home in that mm -hmm. way. Like, his um, routines and habits are paramount to my needs. And it's how we're doing it. That's our way. I think that's a great People way. People do other ways. No, but that's I think that's a way. great way. I think that, yeah. you know, I mean, I have a kid, and kids need stability and routine. Yeah, I think they more seem than to anything. thrive in that. Yeah. I mean, my son loves his little routine, yeah. so yeah. And um, what do you want Rhonda to do in season two? Oh, well, I have a lot of ideas for Rhonda. Please. First of all, I'd like tell. Rhonda to cut her hair, because I cut my hair in real life. 
So um, the first thing I want her to she do in that bunker is cut her ratty hair that she well, ends she up has having at the end. She librarian hair. Well, and then as it go, like I said, there's yeah. a transformation, and by the last episode, she's got some pretty crazy hair. So first thing I'd like her to cut her hair, and then um, I want her to like lead a new like tribe of warrior women. There's going to be like some stuff going into the future of mankind. And I want her to like really evolve into sort of like a Charlize Theron, Mad, Mad Max, Max kind of a lady. And part of it's because I think maybe I want to be obligated to get in great shape and have someone like make it my job <laughs> so that I have like <laughs> muscles that you can see. Yeah. Does she, I mean, she kind of, I don't want to say man's up, but she toughens up as the reality of what's happening sinks in, right? Yeah, she toughens up, and then Megan Mullally's character mm -hmm. uh, softens up. So we have, we influence one another in good ways. How would you do if you, if you were in prison? Would you be like the leader? No. No? You would I be would, like her? I would try to become as invisible as possible. But I read that book, Orange is the New Black, mm -hmm. um, and it's great. So I would do what she did when she was in prison. Like, I think that's, if you're going to go to prison, I think that's a really good handbook. <laughs> because she has really good suggestions on how to survive. Well, watching your character, I was actually thinking, like, God, if that was me, who would I side with? Who would you, me or Megan? N Megan's character? Or the, 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 the gang leader that, oh, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, right, right. Yeah. He's, yeah. Yeah. I don't, oh, right, would I side which gang? Yeah, yes. they try to get me to choose a gang. Um... Yeah, that's just. I mean, obviously, I, I'd you just with don't you. want. You just don't want to join a gang. Yeah, ever. I mean, it's just the stuff you think about when you watch the show. You're like, what would I do? Yeah, which, if the world was which ending, prison gang would yeah. I end up in? If the world is ending, why would you loot TVs from a store? I mean, you're gonna die in 33 days anyway. I did wonder that too, but you know, for the last 30 days, you'd have a great television, really high quality HD. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So I don't know. All cable is covered. You're absolutely yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And now we're, we'll turn it over to the audience. <coughs> Hi. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, first off, thank you for coming. Um, I am from Scranton, so I feel like I would be remiss if I did not ask about The Office. Um, my question is, how did you feel going, because I was at the office wrap party, how does it feel going into a baseball stadium filled with fans? Because I don't think there's many other shows that have ever actually even done that. That was a really, um, that was an amazing, very emotional experience for everyone. And um, yeah, that was, that was once in a lifetime. But, you know, we all feel as in love with Scranton as we could feel Scranton loved the office. Like we, um, that's such a special relationship. And the fact that we all got to go there and kind of say goodbye to the show and have our final cast wrap party in the city where it all was set was really amazing. Really amazing. And it, I have to say, Scranton is so much prettier than I was expecting. <laughs> it's on the water. It's like, it's so gorgeous. It's actually a really pretty city. It's a real, quote, it's a really pretty city. <laughs> Scranton, it's a pretty city. Oh, I was just wondering, do you have any hidden talents? Oh, yes. I can recreate um, meals out of Play-Doh in very tiny form. <laughs> so um, my son got really into Play-Doh and when my son is into something, he is into it. And he played Play-Doh like four times a day for like 45 minutes at a time. Like we mm -hmm. play Play-Doh. And I like to keep it interesting. I mean, I could only make ice creams for so long. So um, I started taking pictures of my dinner at night. And then the next day I would recreate them out of Play-Doh, very tiny. And I think I got really good at it. You should do a museum installation. I feel like I could. I posted a bunch of them on my Instagram. Oh my god! So if I have you to like check go it back out. in my Instagram feed for a while, people were like, at first people were like, "This is so cute! Oh my god, this is amazing!" And then like two weeks later, they were like, "We get it. <laughs> Enough with the Play-Doh food, Jenna." 
Please post anything else <laughs> other than your meal. What was your proudest meal creation in Play-Doh? I'll tell you. Um, it was a seafood jambalaya. No. Yeah. And then I also did this amazing um, mixed green salad with chicken and poppy seed dressing. That I think it was really quite good. I don't even want to know how you did poppy seed dressing inside yeah. of Play-Doh, but I oh, bow, I, I, bow also, down. Um, I always have the same breakfast every morning. And so I took a picture of my breakfast and I had my coffee in my Dunder Mifflin cup, and I recreated my Dunder Mifflin cup out of Play-Doh as well. Oh my God. My cup of coffee. Those are some, some Rhonda has I told, I mean, I go for it. Rhonda has hella talents. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. Hi, um, my name's Margo. Um, super <coughs> exciting to talk to you. We kind of snuck away between our acting classes right now to come and talk to you. Amazing. Um, yeah, but so one of the classes we're doing is uh, voice and speech and we do a lot with physicality in some of our other classes, but um, my question is, I know you said she kind of maybe woman's up, um, bulks up, has a big physical change. How much do you put into um, really kind of crafting this, you know, vocal journey that she kind of goes through, physical journey, um, and really, you know, your prep work, prep work and really finding out how to get in the mind of um, this character? Oh my God, I love this. This is a super nerdy, crafty question. <laughs> um, um, and I'm excited. Uh, so I don't know, have you ever heard of Feldenkrais? It's a, it's a movement exercise and actors and acting classes, some conservatories teach Feldenkrais and some teach other techniques. And um, so I have traditionally very bad posture just as a person. And this has always sort of naturally served the roles that I'm playing, you know. I didn't need to worry about my posture when I was playing Pam or most of the other characters I play, but I knew that this character was gonna go on a journey. And um, so before I did this role, I studied Feldenkrais and I did the exercises because it's particularly good at helping you reset your body and reset your posture. So I did that because I knew that starting around episode five or six. Mm -hmm. I'm already sitting up straight. Yeah, up. I know, but you can only like hold yourself in posture um, consciously for so long. So I need to create a way that my body would hold itself in posture, in a, in a good posture position. And that's what the Feldenkrais mm -hmm. exercises can do. So that was one thing. And then the other was that at the beginning, you kind of saw in the clip, I'm doing a lot of like, ooh, me, you know, like looking around and more facially expressive. And I knew that by the end there was going to be like more of a, a stoic um, way that she communicated that was uh, very direct, without blinking, without a lot of movement, very still. And so I purposely started her a little bit kind of more gestury and very free and loose in her body and bad posture. And at the end, she's standing tall and she speaks straight and clear. And, and that was really fun for me. And, and Megan Mullally is completely transformed in this and she did a lot of physical work. Her character is very low to the ground and very kind of bouncy and um, and, and that was really exciting to see. And she she really transformed in a physical way for the part. She's really unrecognizable. Yeah, I mean, she's, she's really actory, like in, in the best way. Mm -hmm. Like she puts a lot of thought and time into her choices. And um, she comes with a lot of ideas and is fully memorized. It was very professional. And, and over there, acting is... Um, it's a craft, it's a skill. Uh, to be an actor, you go to acting school, and if you're an actor on television or in film or on the stage, they're all respected at the same level. There's no kind of hierarchy, it's a trade, and that is um, how it's looked at. There's not the same sort of like reverence paid to actors or celebrity that uh, America kind of puts on people. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really fun. It felt kind of like being in theater school again like really super cool actor thing. And we have time for one more question, please. Hello, Jenna. I just wanted to know what was your favorite end of the world apocalyptic movie, and did you use any of them to inspire you for this role? Oh my gosh, well, that's a good question. Because I do, I do love me the, a good disaster film. And you love horror films too, right? I do. So I mean, it's like, I'm not sure it gets better than Dawn of the Dead. 
Like, I always like it at, at the end of times when there's some zombies, slow-moving zombies. Mm -hmm. I know the remake of Dawn of the Dead, the zombies move quickly, but I was always more scared by the very sort of lumbering, slow zombies. But, um, no, I didn't, I didn't really draw any inspiration from, from other things like that. Um, I, I, I can't say that I did. I can't say I did, but I, I love that kind of stuff. Like I love, I love movies like that. Well, thank you so much, Miss Jenna Fisher. Thank you to the great audience. And the show premieres on the 28th, correct? Yeah. Uh, it premieres on the 28th on NBC. Thursdays at 8 p.m. It is seriously worth your while. Watch it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks.